everybody and welcome back to uh, peacemaker podcast uh, and first of all happy new year uh, i hope uh, everybody will have a, a better and uh, prosperous uh, 2024 and onwards so today we have a very special guest uh, it's a uh, a uh, guest from Germany, but uh, uh, reporting from uh, Thailand, right? Yes, from Bangkok, yes. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so uh, this is uh, Inga Faust, security expert, uh, former uh, police uh, officer, police sergeant, right? <laughs> mm -hmm, yes. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, uh, Tell us something more about you and your business uh, in security. And uh, uh, my question is uh, uh, how to bring security in insecure world. Mm -hmm. That's okay. uh, uh, exactly our topic, what we do with our company. I'm the co-founder and security risk manager of Foxpedition. Um, yeah, we provide um, security services and medical plannings for organizations who uh, go abroad um, and far away from their known environment. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm an ex-police officer. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm born in the north of Germany, close to the border of Denmark. Um, then I moved to Munich. Um, my last position was the motorcycle squad in, in Munich. And I studied security and disaster management. Um, yeah, in Munich, then um, I studied general management in Salzburg, in Austria, and also in the US and Canada. And um, yeah, I'm 29 years old, and now I'm in Bangkok um, working remote. <laughs> mm, that's that's very good. It's a kind of dream job. You are <laughs> True, at a yes. nice place uh, doing something and earning some income. That's that's exactly very very good. <laughs> but uh, uh, I checked your uh, Fox Pedition uh, website, and it says uh, your mission is to bring safety to unsafe uh, environment. How how do exactly. you do that? Um, yeah, my favorite topic in my studies for security and disaster management uh, was risk management. And what I like about it that you can um, kind of take this concept risk management and yeah bring it into every environment. And um, we always look at um, yeah at everything which couldn't occur. Uh, my husband is a paramedic, so he does the medical planning, and I do the security planning because we notice that um, sometimes the concepts don't match. You have a medical company who does the medical part, you have a security company who does the security part, but sometimes they just don't match. So we're working together on one concept, security and medical. We also look at nature hazards when, which can occur at um, crime rates. Um, and we also try to look uh, a little bit in the future. Of course, um, you cannot um, tell everything which will happen in the future, um, but we always try to look not only what is the status now and what was yesterday, we also try um, yeah, to look a little bit what can occur maybe in, in the next um, period of time when the company is there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, security uh, assessment is uh, very, uh, very uh, thorough and, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, catch-all uh, job. Uh, do you uh, actually uh, collect information for your security assessment uh, from local law uh, enforcement agencies uh, only, or uh, you also have a cooperation with some other organizations or, or companies yes. uh, to share information uh, when you are on, on your assignment? Yes. Yeah, we have a lot of corporations around the world. So right now we use the, the year um, to um, flourish this cooperation. So we can now provide services uh, more or less in all parts of the world. And yeah, that's also part of our concept that we don't sit in our uh, office and we do everything remote and we just check the news and that's our risk assessment. We also ask people on the ground, um, yeah, like our security providers, we know they're um, 
that we really have information from on on the ground and we try to ask as much um, different people as possible. For example, we've been to El Salvador and if you ask the taxi driver there, he will say everything is perfect here, um, life is much more safe. But if you ask a journalist, for example, and journalists will tell you um, it's it's getting worse for us because um, the, the press is not free. So we try to ask as many um, organizations as possible and especially these people who we will be working with. For example, if we work with journalists in El Salvador, of course, we also need to ask uh, journalists who are there or who've been uh, to Salvador, uh, El Salvador um, what is going on. When you are collecting information for your security assessments, how do you avoid uh, uh, your interlocutor's bias? For instance, uh, maybe they, they portray situation in, in the, uh, through their eyes, uh, maybe in wrong way, so it can misguide, mislead your uh, mm -hmm. conclusions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we we try to travel as much countries as possible, not only as like a security provider, but also as a tourist that we can really look and ask as much people as possible that we don't come like as a security provider with, I don't know, um, our body armor and stuff that we really come and say, hey, we're just a tourist. We're just asking questions for our own safety, for our own security. And that's how we get a lot of information. Um, yeah. And of course, like I mentioned, ask as much uh, organizations as possible. Oftentimes there are NGOs down there. Um, oftentimes we know security companies. Um, we can make uh, contact to, to governmental organizations. So we have different point of views. Um, yeah, and of course, um, if it's in the budget, we try to travel somewhere ourselves beforehand, before the organization goes there, that we can really make our own experience. Um, yeah. that we don't have as much as a bias. Um, for example, with Bahrain, with, we have really recently been to Bahrain and we experienced it as, as really a safe country. Um, but I also know from other people that a few years ago it has been really um, many riots. And um, yeah, so we try to collect data, of course, from the past, from people who've been there, but we also try to um, go, go there ourselves or to have um, yeah, local personnel on the ground who can say, hey, this is happening. And um, this is the past. <laughs> yeah, uh, personal experience definitely means uh, a lot, especially uh, your experience as a police officer and plus uh, uh, those travels where you can really see and feel uh, some some details which uh, can yes. lead you to conclusion. But uh, in, in your opinion, uh, we are in 2024 do you think uh, the world will be safer or why not <laughs> <laughs> um i think it really depends where you are um for example we've been like i mentioned in bahrain and saudi arabia and i really feel that they want to be western or they want to open up to the world and if i ask people who've been there like five years ago they said um yeah, you can't can't really do anything. And now we've been uh, at a giant music festival. So some countries are getting um, safer, I think. Some countries are opening up to, to tourism. Um, but there are also some countries, um, we see it in, in Europe or in the US, um, where you have very pol polarized groups right now, very leftist group, very right wing group. And um, yeah, for example, the, the US, I think, will get unsafer. Um, countries like Saudi Arabia, for example, will get safer. And um, we've also traveled um, Latin America and South America a lot. Um, yeah, in my opinion, it's getting safer, but you never know if there's new, um, yeah, if if people take more drugs, for example, if um, there's more uh, drug trafficking, um, if you have a new government, which maybe um, is not anti-corruption, uh, for example, then it will get worse. So it's really hard to say. Um, but I think, um, yeah, some countries will get safer and some, um, yeah, will in, uh, decrease. Uh -huh. Well, I also uh, learned that uh, you have been uh, in a Siege Shepherd operation. So can you mm -hmm. tell us something about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
It was uh, quite funny how uh, how I uh, got there because I applied in December last year. Um, I was sitting on the sofa and thinking, what do I want to do next year? Because I just uh, quit my do job and thought, okay, what, what am I doing now with this uh, new freedom? And um, yeah, so I applied to, to Sea Shepherd and I didn't hear from them for half a year. So I kind of forgot about it. And suddenly they, um, they called me and said, hey, do you want to go to Namibia on our, one of our ships uh, in like three weeks? And I was like, uh, sure, why not? And um, yeah, it was really interesting experience because it was my first time on such a commercial, I would call it a commercial vessel. Um, um, yes, and I joined um, at first as a deckhand because I said um, I want to have like this full maritime ship life experience. I really want to know how it is on the ground, um, how the people are working, how the safety standard is, how the life is on a ship because yeah, you're very, you have a lot of people around you like the whole time. You have the sea. Um, yeah, and um, then I also wrote a security concept for when people go leave the board and uh, leave the boat and go um, on the shore. Um, yeah, so I, I looked uh, into how, Nam how safe Namibia is um, because also in Africa, you always think, oh, Africa is so dangerous, but uh, Namibia is a very safe country. So you need to have a different standard like um, in other operational environments uh, Sea Shepherd is in like Gambia or Libya. So um, yeah, I put up a security concept for, for going on shore. Um, but yeah, I mainly joined as a, as a deckhand to get like the, the ship life experience. Yeah, so that's very interesting, uh, but uh, it uh, uh, brings me uh, an additional question. You know that uh, these days uh, uh, the Horn of Africa uh, is uh, again a dangerous mm -hmm. place for boats uh, uh, because of uh, uh, attacks uh, by by Houthis and uh, mm -hmm. and there is a coalition of uh, European and American uh, ships uh, which uh, which are trying to uh, let's say protect uh, commercial ships. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know that area uh, has always been uh, troublesome because of uh, uh, maritime piracy. But uh, uh, this, what happens now, uh, I, I wouldn't call piracy because they don't uh, hijack uh, vessels uh, for ransom. You know uh, they have political motivation, so it's uh, uh, closer to maritime terrorism so uh, what's your uh, intake on that what do you think how how uh, the situation can can be solved and if, mm -hmm. if that uh, that can be solved yeah um i think it's very difficult uh, situation because um we always see it in security like in in times where um, there's a lot of trouble, a lot of terrorism, then people uh, back up their security, then they say, okay, now we want weapons, now we want uh, law enforcement, um, whatever. And then by this measurements, then um, suddenly, of course, the terrorism in, uh, decreases because they don't have that much chance anymore. Then they kind of forget about it again. I think that kind of happened at um, Horn of Africa. And yeah, now they're coming back again and um, they ex extremely good equipped like you're saying it's more like um, political activation anymore than like normal um, ransom and by that they have yeah kind of good money resources so they come by by helicopters and by um, stuff we've uh, basically never seen before um, so um, yeah um, I think it's really good that a lot of uh, ships or vessels now have uh, like their own security team um, like professionals who, um, yeah, you you need to be highly armed uh, if you if you go there. So um, yeah, but I think you really need to think like like I said, you really need to look a little bit in the future. I cannot say oh, back in the days the pirates had like tiny ships and uh, have been like three four people and like some guns or something. You really now need to think okay, they might come by helicopters because they're highly funded by terrorist um, organizations. So yeah. I think you have to to fight them now like you you have to fight um um terrorists so yeah 
I know it for like Sea Shepherd uh, does it. Maybe it's it's not the best. Um, um, yeah, not the best conclusion, but um, they also work a lot with the law enforcement. Um, so from the country, like in Namibia, they work together with the Namibian government. And I think if, if you have an vessel and you want to go around um, Horn of Africa, you also need to, to work with the government and see if you can get some uh, governmental um, yeah, resources and some governmental um, security and safety. Because if you just fight them on your own, it's... yeah kind of like like a war zone we already see on um on the sea and on the oceans so yeah i think it's always a good approach to go with the with the government yeah yeah i could see uh, on some uh, footages uh, uh, the crew of the of, of the ships uh, they put some barbed wire you know <laughs> uh, all around you know to prevent uh, you know boarding of, uh, uh, of terrorists or pirates, mm. whatever we call them. Uh, so you are from Germany. Uh, well, uh, this channel uh, cannot avoid uh, political questions, you know, uh, but I will, I, will, I will not be uh, too harsh about uh, uh, politics. Uh, we know that uh, uh, in Germany currently we have uh, around one Point two million uh, refugees from uh, uh, from Ukraine. So, uh, and uh, I could see that uh, you were volunteer in uh, SPD uh, political party, mm -hmm. social mm -hmm. uh, social democratic uh, party. I don't know if you are still active or not, uh, but uh, what what do you think? Uh, 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 is it uh, going to reflect uh, on security in Germany? Uh, let's say uh, only uh, 1.2 million uh, Ukrainian refugees plus uh, refugees and uh, asylum seekers, uh, uh, e economy migrants uh, from uh, Africa, from Middle mm -hmm. East, uh, etc., etc. It's uh, a lot of people, you know. So do you yes. think uh, the government is uh, doing well or they know what they are doing? <laughs> yeah, um, I actually quit, uh, quit the social uh, party, so I'm not a member anymore. And of course, uh, also plays a role or my decision um, is based on what I see in politics right now, um, because I yeah don't see my values anymore with the um, Social Democratic Party, um, because I think they're not doing enough it's not like social anymore you know and um, I think if you of course you need to take refugees you just um, you need to let them in but then you need to do something with them you cannot just open the border say okay welcome come in and then um, try to include yourself to the society you have to to help them with that for example in Germany refugees are not like allowed to work till they get their permit and this could take years and years and um, so I don't know why they don't um, speed up the process because people come to a country and they're used to work. Like in other countries, you don't have this social net like you have to in, in Germany. Um, like here in Thailand, if you don't work, you don't have money, you know, and they're used to work. So they come somewhere and they say, hey, I want to work. Um, and then they're told like, no, you, you're not allowed to work. But here's everything basically you need um, to to get along. And I think that's that's. Um, yeah, that, that's just not um, helping, I think. Um, so, um, yeah, this and of course, um, crime rates. If you have a lot of people who have nothing to do, you have um, also crime rates which go up. I mean, it's not only the, the refugees who commit crimes, it's also a lot of uh, bored Germans who, who commit crimes. Um, but I think you have to be a little bit, also speed up the, the process of, um, yeah, of um, uh, punishment, you know, so if, if you, take someone to court for something what he has done like three years ago he maybe doesn't even remember what he actually did you know um so i think you need to speed up all this process um yeah not only the in, uh, inclusion of people who come from abroad but also um yeah when they did something wrong the punishment need to be um yeah very on time and not like in in three four years um well, uh, apart from this uh, project that I work on, you know, this uh, YouTube uh, channel and podcast, 
I'm also a program, senior program manager uh, in uh, Stop Trafficking of People. So I'm also uh, very interested uh, to know if, if you uh, have any information uh, about the uh, state of uh, uh, human trafficking uh, among those uh, refugees. Uh, do you have any information? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Is there um, any increased rate or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I recently read that Germany has um, the highest human trafficking rate in whole Europe and that really shocked me because I, I knew um, I worked in northern Germany at the border to Denmark um, in the police and I knew that there are a lot of um, human trafficking around um, the border but that um, yeah, Germany really is like more or less the country with the highest human trafficking rate that um, really shook me so and yeah of course the ukrainian refugees um, a lot of women who come they come as prostitutes um, or they're more or less forced to work in ukraine already as as prostitutes and then of course they're they're trafficked um, and also to germany so i think um yeah like i mentioned when we're not doing enough we're not doing enough on on crime rates and um so this is a, a big problem um so i think you just need to back up like the law enforcement because i also see that's why i um, left the police i also see a decrease there they're not uh, getting paid enough they don't have um, the res re resources they they need for the crime we see right now because we have a lot of um, cyber crime for example and yeah also we have open borders more or less uh, with eu we have open borders and that's nice for traveling, of course, but it's also nice for human traffickers. And um, so I really think um, you need to have like border control or more border control because it's, it's not a problem. If you see someone with EU passport, you can let them through. But if you see someone um, yeah, with a bunch of uh, girls in their, uh, in their trunk, then you need to stop them. But if you just have open borders and everybody can just rush through Germany and is not bothered at all, I think that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a lot of uh, friends and family members uh, in Germany and I often talk to them uh, about various issues uh, and yeah, uh, it is indeed uh, much easier now compared to, let's say, about 20 years ago when I started working uh, on, you know, fighting uh, against trafficking. Uh, I started in uh, in the Balkans and uh, and then you know we uh, we grew up uh, internationally uh, so uh, it used to be a problem for traffickers to smuggle uh, persons uh, not only we are not only talking about uh, sex slaves uh, we are also talking about uh, uh, those uh, uh, people who are trafficked for forcible labor uh, which is uh, also mm. a big issue uh, and now with the open borders, uh, uh, with full freedom of movement, uh, especially if you reach one EU country, then you are fine. It makes uh, mm -hmm. their, their job much easier. And in contact yes. with uh, law enforcement uh, agencies, I don't know why, but uh, they are kind of reluctant uh, to uh, uh, to admit uh, that uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, holes and although yes. uh, when you read uh, uh, when you read uh, legislation which is uh, tackling uh, fighting against uh, trafficking of people uh, everything looks fine you know but uh, mm -hmm. in reality we we can see big issues yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's not only people, it's also weapons. Um, like in Germany, one third of all weapons are legal registers and um, two thirds are illegal weapons. So and where do they come from? They're not like produced in Germany and sold in Germany. They probably come over the border. So um, there are a lot of issues where I would say um, you need um, more border control and or if you have eu then you need like european police like for example if there are a lot of also a lot of cars like stolen in berlin and then go to to poland and if they leave the border from germany to poland then the um, german law enforcement say okay we can't do anything and i think that's also a big problem so you have open borders but then you have like european police or you have like border control for every country and um 
yeah, and it's also working, but like this, I think it's not, yeah, not a good system. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking about uh, uh, further on politics, uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, United States uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, and this uh, 2024 uh, will be elections uh, for presidential mm -hmm. elections. So, what do you think? Uh, uh, <laughs> what's going to happen <laughs> honestly about the us um i have no idea i would i would have said when uh that donald trump might have been re-elected but now i think he's banned from from the um that he cannot um yeah be president anymore uh, maybe this changes again so i think yeah. that um yeah, we don't know what's happening yeah it's US. very hard to predict <laughs> <laughs> yes it is but i really think that it could be someone I would say crazy like Donald Trump who could be president because I think right now and like I mentioned there are a lot of left wings a lot of right wings there are not much people in the center anymore not a lot of, lot of people who say okay we want someone reasonable to be president I think there are a lot of people who say we want a extreme left or extreme right president and yeah I think I don't hope so but I'm pretty sure that this will happen that there will be some some extreme uh, candidate who will win, mm -hmm. maybe a celebrity. I don't know. Maybe a Kardashian or <laughs> I don't know someone, <laughs> someone famous yeah. who just the people say like, oh yeah, whatever. We're fed up. We want someone, someone special, someone who is like Donald Trump, for example. So, mm. yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, it's very difficult to predict uh, anything in yes. po uh, in politics uh, because we don't have a crystal ball, you know, no, to, exactly. to predict. Uh, even yeah. if we have crystal ball, we have to calibrate it uh, occasionally yes. <laughs> because yes, for sure. you know uh, the world. Uh, that's why I asked you uh, in the beginning, you know, uh, how to bring uh, security to insecure world. Uh, it seems that uh, in the past, uh, let's say, uh, one decade, everything uh, is upside down. Uh, people mm -hmm. are uh, bloodthirsty and more violent and uh, less tolerant. Uh, yes. So how can you explain that uh, as mm -hmm. a security yeah, expert? Mm -hmm. I think the, the cyberspace does a lot, does a lot of... Um, yeah, that people think they have their own bubble, you know, like before the internet, you need to go out, you need to speak to your neighbors, you have uh, friends who live in your neighborhood. Um, and right and now you can your connect. Face. And show your yeah. face. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And go somewhere in person and actually um, do something in person. I really recently read a post on Instagram. I don't know if it's really true or not but i can really imagine that it is that some people are afraid to go to a restaurant because they really have to have like contact to a real person and they have to decide from a menu they don't know before and um i don't know if it's nonsense or not but i could imagine that it's true because yeah you don't like for example with COVID, you saw that uh, some people don't have didn't have to leave their house for like two years and especially for, for young people, I think it does a lot of damage if you don't have this social interaction um, Yeah, with basically everybody. You know, when I went to school, I'm not like super old or something, but um, yeah, I needed to talk to the bus driver. Then uh, I needed to talk to my neighbors I sit with. Then I need to talk to people in school. And um, yeah, there are a lot of opinions who come to me who I needed to react for a lot of different people. And right now, if you have your cyberspace and um, yeah, you just talk to people who have your opinion and uh, then you go out in the real world and there are a lot of people who are maybe different and then you go back to home because you don't like that. And then um, I think it's a spiral which which goes down. Uh, the less contact you have to the outer world, the less you want contact to the outer world. And um, yeah, I think spending too much time in the, in the Internet, even though I work remote, I think it's really, really bad for the society and it's just a spiral because it also makes addictive you know I think there are a lot of people addictive to their phones and addictive to the internet and um, they don't want to admit it because it's so common to be on your phone the whole time so no one really talks about like internet addiction and I think that's a serious problem mm -hmm. yeah that's very interesting uh, we will continue after short break 
uh, and then we will continue about this uh, interesting topic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, welcome back to podcast uh, Peacemaker uh, with uh, uh, today's guest uh, Inga Faust, uh, security expert. Before the break, we uh, we talked. Uh, we just started uh, uh, talking about uh, why uh, the world is upside down, why people became more violent, uh, and you started. Uh, uh, explaining uh, 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 that uh, could be one of the reasons uh, uh, that the uh, internet, uh, uh, let's say, more, uh, uh, let's say, free access to internet to everybody. <laughs> Just, yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. do you think uh, uh, people are using uh, too much of uh, poisonous uh, and hate speech uh, especially when they don't show their face, they can use avatars, uh, they can mm -hmm. be under uh, different uh, names. Uh, you said uh, uh, before internet uh, age, uh, people should go out and talk uh, in person, you know. Mm -hmm. Now it's uh, much yeah. easier, so uh, we can yeah. continue about this. Yes, for sure. Um, yeah. Um, I think I so also saw it. I was a highway police officer before I uh, came to Munich and I saw there as well, like with road rage, um, you're also kind of anonymous. You have your, your car and this is kind of like a safe space for you. So people, yeah, then they do stuff in their car, which is completely crazy. And then they get out of the car and then they talk to each other and then they are extremely nice to each other. Um, but if you have like this safe space and you think you can do whatever you want and without any um, any yeah punishment for what you're doing, um, and I think that's that's also what we see in the in the cyberspace. And uh, even um, we met on LinkedIn, and even on LinkedIn where people show their face, where they have their profession and their uh, their name, also there do you see that um, yeah people sometimes go crazy and yeah like you mentioned do hate speech and whatever and they have like a medical doctor or something in their title but they think they're anonymous they sit at home at the computer they don't see the other person um but yeah which they're hating on and i think that's that's a big problem and i think we see this problem also in all of the wars we have right now um that there are a lot of emotions also involved from the politics of course from the people who are on the ground the, the civilization they are um they are the the victims when we also see that um yeah the politicians or the societies which don't have much to do with this war um that they sometimes go go crazy even they have no idea what's going on on the ground yeah i think you pointed out quite well uh, uh i'm trying to minimize my uh, comments on linkedin i'm very active on LinkedIn, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. and i have a lot of followers uh, and i wrote uh, many articles i also wrote uh, several books but uh, i noticed uh, especially uh, when uh, when this uh, uh, conflict in uh, in uh, Israel and Palestine uh, uh, revived, you know, people are not using uh, uh, brains; uh, they use uh, yes. emotions yeah, when they are exactly. commenting. So uh, it's not a good way. Uh, but uh, who who am I to? <laughs> to judge people right <laughs> yes. they're all yeah, sure, of course. Own people but uh, as a political scientist you know i uh, uh, i'm trained uh, to to balance uh, you know uh, to to be uh, to be imp uh, impartial uh, you know uh, to to mm -hmm. look at the facts uh, what yes. facts uh, are telling uh, then i can draw some conclusions uh, yeah. But uh, further on, uh, uh, internet. Uh, do you think uh, cyber security is uh, a really big issue, or it's uh, kind of contained? I know it's always uh, mm. a kind of uh, cat and mouse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think 
um, it's it's developing um, faster. Like the cyber crimes are developing faster than the the law enforcement can and can back up because of course you always have like a new crime. Like for example, now we see it with AI that you can deep fake videos, for example. And yeah, there's always like you're saying cat and mouse. Um, like there is like a new crime and the law enforcement have to back up. You cannot really predict what will be the next cyber crime or something of course you can try but it's really really hard because i think one year ago no one really saw this deep faking videos um, coming um, but i also think that a lot of threats of course you need to have like a good cyber security but i think everybody looks looks on this right now everybody says oh i i need um yeah in an organization i need really good um firewalls and stuff like that. I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but um, I think there are a lot of people doing a lot for their IT security, but then people still use passwords like one, two, three, four, five. They or still put a post <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Or they still put like a post-it on their computer where they have like all of their their passwords. And um, I think that you sometimes overestimate cybersecurity and underestimate um, the mistakes that people do. Um, yeah, for example, I know that um, the the cleaners who work in police departments, I know that um, they um, someone did uh, intelligence on them. So you really know um, yeah, where they are from, what they did in their life, uh, if they commit crimes. Um, but I don't know if every organization does it. And, you know, cleaners have access to everything. So if you want um, there's like a TV show in Germany where, um, yeah, a person, yeah, tries to sneak into into organizations, and they mostly come as cleaners or as uh, craftsmen or someone uh, who's working on the building because no one really cares for them, but they have access to everything, and um, these are things where I would say I think we should look at this more. Of course, cybersecurity is very important, and I think cybersecurity really is, is on the board, but this always has to do with um, educating people um, in their organization what what they have to do with their um, laptops. Um, yeah, or they talk to who they talk to in bars, you know, because spies don't come with like this, this iconic hat and a trench coat, you know, they sometimes come as um, good looking ladies in a bar and if you tell like a random lady at the bar everything you know about your organizations and you have like really nice firewalls and stuff but it's not helping you if this person uh, gives out every secret you have in your company you know when i uh, 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 did my consultancy work uh, uh, also uh, about security uh, among other issues because i am expert in several uh, fields including security and uh, uh, before i uh, uh, i was uh, uh, actually engaged uh, in in that uh, business uh, uh, i actually uh, for that company specific company i, I will not name it it's bigger <laughs> company uh, i actually uh, asked the, the uh, it uh, team uh, to make a uh, phishing email uh, and then to yes. to make statistics uh, believe me uh, yeah. uh, they are all uh, highly educated uh, very smart people uh, experts uh, yes you no know, second to none but uh, mm -hmm. uh, the rate of uh, uh, those who uh, were uh, who clicked the uh, wrong uh, uh, link it was 96 point six percent yeah that's, <laughs> that's it, ridiculous yeah. it's so it's yeah. so easy for uh yeah uh, yeah. It, yeah hackers you know they they uh, yeah. give you something that looks like uh, and i think it's a problem of uh, attention of the people actually yes. the, the uh, att attention span is shorter and shorter and people mm -hmm. are not even reading carefully, uh, they're just uh, glancing, no. you know. Yes, just, yes. And yeah. They, they and, could... yeah, and I think you don't really have, also in schools, I don't know how it is uh, now, but you don't really have the education on 
yeah on on cyberspace uh, because even you have children who have smartphones and they have TikTok and Instagram and so cyberspace for them is like fun you know you can look uh, cat videos and you can watch soccer and uh, you can chat with people around the world this is like really fun so I think we don't really yeah like you're saying then if someone is uh, sending like an email and was saying this is like a funny cat video and then 69 percent and 96 percent i think you said uh, they they click on this this link in this mail because they think yeah cyberspace is fun you know they don't see the threat which could be uh, behind that because yeah. it's not like visible or something yeah especially it's dangerous for for children because there are a lot of uh, predators internet predators uh, you know yes pedophiles and and stuff like that yeah. so we we all yes. have to be careful uh, especially those who have children you know yes keep eyes open <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah i I recently read a, a good uh, post who summed it up uh, uh, quite good. They said you um, you black out your your license plate if you take a photo of your car, but in the same second you post like a naked photo of your baby. So um, <laughs> please think about it. You know. So. Yeah, yeah. Privacy is uh, <laughs> pretty in, da in danger. But yeah. uh, can you? Tell us uh, what was the the most dangerous uh, uh, assignment or situation you experienced in your career. Um, yeah, I think most of it really comes from from the police um, because uh, the private uh, security projects we did till now they always were in kind of. Yeah, they have been remote or in kind of like a more or less safe environment, I would say. Um, but I think it's really, um, or, or you um, know that you will go to a dangerous situation, you know. If you uh, go on a, on a ship, for example, which will sail um, yeah, the oceans, then you, you know that this might uh, be a problem. But if you live your everyday life, life like an everyday uh, police officer, um, you really don't know we did a lot of traffic controls really don't know if they're so, like a nice person or is a, does he have a gun or a knife or whatever so yeah right now you're eating your lunch and the next second uh, someone calls you and say there uh, are people um, shooting around themselves and and you have to have to go there and um, I recently talked to to an, another close protection officer and he also said in private security like as a pros close protection officer you kind of run away from the danger you don't want your client in danger you so you always try to keep your client out of danger so if you see something which is dangerous or a hazard or whatever you always try to get away from it and as a police officer you do the extreme opposite you just yeah you need to go there because if you don't go there no one does you know and yeah. especially if you do like your normal um normal patrol and normal um city department you really don't know what's around the edge so um yeah i think the most dangerous situations really come from from my police career uh, which are not predictable because if you go to for example to to ukraine right now if you um yeah backup journalists who are on the on the front line you know it will be dangerous so you have your helmet and your vest and and everything you need but um yeah if you're normal cop on the street of course you also have your your bulletproof vest and stuff but it's hot so you don't wear it you know how it is and um mm. yeah then something something happens and it's really can can happen in split seconds so um yeah i think that's the unpredictable uh things well, which are dangerous yeah uh, and you mentioned uh, journalists uh, in in the war uh, a lot of journalists, uh, unfortunately, uh, have been killed uh, recently in uh, in Gaza, uh, also in Ukraine, uh, but uh, far less. But uh, you know, uh, and some somebody uh, hires uh, close protection uh, officers, uh, you know, to to you know to protect them. Uh, people have uh, uh, too much uh, expectation. They they expect you even to catch uh, to catch uh, uh, a projectile. You know. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> true. Mm. I'm I'm telling yeah. this as a, as a war veteran. 
uh, war veteran who is sick of wars. You know, that's why I yes. started this channel, Peacemaker. Mm -hmm. And I hope uh, starting from this year, uh, the world will be much uh, better place to live. Uh, do you have uh, any, any, let's say, uh, message for our audience? Uh, what do you want to uh, advise them uh, or uh, wish for this year onward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say in general, I hope that people m talk more to each other. And like you say, a podcast is called a Peacemaker. And I think by, by communication, um, also across borders, um, I think you can solve a lot of problems or at least understand the position the other person has. And I think that's also a lot of has a lot of to do with security. If you're uh, like a security operator, you also need to talk a lot to your client and not only to your client, also to the people in the environment your client will be working in. And it doesn't matter if you do corporate security for your uh, company in your home country or if you do um, yeah, NGO security abroad. I think communication is, is key to basically, um, yeah, every context in life. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I understand that uh, you have a lot of work to do because you are not only uh, enjoying... Uh... By the way, uh, how's the weather in uh, Thailand right now? It, it's really nice. I think we still have, it's now 10 p.m. and I think we still have 30 degrees or something. Yeah, 27. So, uh, only weather 27. is really, really good. Ah, yeah. <laughs> only 27 at 10 yeah. p.m. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I will uh, uh, say goodbye uh, to you and our uh, uh, followers, subscribers. I hope. Uh, uh, people will uh, have positive reactions on uh, on this uh, podcast thank you very much uh, uh, for your participation and uh, do you have anything else uh, at the end uh, you can also thank you you can also uh, use free reclama uh, you know advertisement for for okay. your company <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah um thank you very much for having me it was uh, really fun um you can follow me on on linkedin or on instagram um yeah and of course you can write me an email or a message if if you need something if you need some advice um yeah and happy new year thank you <laughs> excellent Thank you very much. And this was uh, uh, podcast uh, number one in 2024. So uh, I wish you uh, all the best. So see you. See you. Thank you very much. Bye.